Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome everyone to our event today. This is the second session, uh, a part two of our program in which we are examining the interrelated issues of Indo-Pacific security, the regional security architecture and Taiwan. Um, we had a terrific event yesterday and that's online. Uh, so if you missed it, uh, you can find it on CSIS.org and on, on YouTube. Uh, we had an introductory session, uh, a conversation between me and Congressman Ami Berra, uh, followed by a terrific panel with guests from Japan and uh, on Australia and uh, from the United States and, uh, and Taiwan. Uh, so today we're going to continue this conversation uh, because there are other parts of the Indo-Pacific region that are critically important uh, for Taiwan. And so today we have guests from India, from Vietnam, uh, from the Philippines, and also uh, from Taiwan. Uh, so we are, we are thrilled to have uh, all of these really excellent experts uh, who focus on Indo-Pacific security to join this conversation today. And then at the end of our panel, uh, which will last one hour and 15 minutes, we're going to have uh, a, uh, a speech, uh, keynote speech, and then again, a conversation with me uh, by Foreign Minister Joseph Wu uh, from Taiwan. Uh, so I hope that you will all stay for that. Um, uh, I'm Bonnie Glazer. Uh, I'm director of the China Power Project at the Center for Strategic and, uh, and International Studies. And so I'm going to start by briefly uh, introducing our speakers today. Um, they will, of course, provide their personal perspectives, but also talk about how their individual countries view Taiwan in the region, its role, uh, how uh, it interacts uh, with Taiwan, uh, and uh, how, it view how each of these countries and uh, these experts view the regional security architecture, which yesterday I described as, uh, as, as a, a a hodgepodge or an alphabet soup uh, of different mechanisms uh, that are interlocked, uh, but uh, and and of course overlap, uh, but uh, don't necessarily add up uh, to an a, an effective enough uh, architecture in the region. Certainly, where Taiwan is uh, uh, is concerned, since Taiwan is only a member of uh, APEC. Uh, and does not have a voice or a seat in the other international organizations. So um, the first uh, person who will uh, speak to us today is Dr. Herman Kraft. He is professor and chair of the uh, uh, Department of Political Science at the University of uh, the Philippines uh, at Dilamon in Quezon City. He's also concurrently a convener of the Strategic Studies Program of the Center for Integrative and Development Studies at the University of the Philippines. And next we'll hear from uh, Win Hong Son, who is Director General of the Institute for South China Sea and East China Sea Studies at the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. Uh, prior to joining the Diplomatic Academy uh, in 2008, Dr. Win was a diplomat, uh, where he served as the Director of the Political Affairs Division in the ASEAN Department at the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs in Vietnam. And then we'll hear from Tan Vi Madan, who is a senior fellow in the Project on International Order and Strategy in the Foreign Policy Program uh, at the Brookings Institution and also uh, director of uh, the India Project there. Uh, she focuses on Indo-Pacific security issues and her most recent book is entitled Fateful Triangle, How China Shaped U.S.-India Relations During the Cold War. And then finally, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Alan Hao Young, who is executive director of the Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation, which is a think tank that's facilitating Taiwan's new southbound policy. Uh, 
He also serves as Deputy Director of the Institute of International Relations and Executive Director of the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at National Zhengzhou University in Taiwan. And since 2018, he has served as a policy advisor uh, to Taiwan's Executive UN. So um, I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, Dr. Herman Kraft uh, for his remarks. Please go ahead. Ah, did we lose no, Dr. Kraft? Uh, we, we have some technical difficulties this morning. Okay. So um, am I... Um, Okay. Um, good morning or good evening to everyone. Um, and first of all, I'd, I'd like to um, thank the organizers the for inviting me to this um, to this session, which 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 I, I think is a very very important uh, uh, topic to actually discuss in, in, in this day in these days. Um, the the Philippine policy on matters that pertain to Taiwan follows a strict adherence to the One China policy. At least that's. That's the claim of the current uh, uh, administration in power. Um, it's a policy which actually caused a significant diplomatic rift between the government of Taiwan and the Duterte administration at the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Duterte administration had included Taiwan on its travel ban when it imposed restrictions on travel to and from China and its territories of Hong Kong and Macau in February of 2020. This was justified and explained in the context of the observance of the One China policy, even as at that time, Taiwan had, and as shown by subsequent events, now, uh, Taiwan had actually um, been able to put into place uh, effective safeguards against the disease and the transmission of the virus. Suffice to say that the government of Taiwan was not impressed at all, and even threatened sanctions, uh, which included the withdrawal of the visa-free privilege uh, enjoyed by Filipinos. The issue, however, is interesting in the sense that it illustrates just how, uh, how much Taiwan uh, is the emphasized as far as Philippine foreign policy is concerned. Um, there is a tendency to be very single-minded about I'm sorry, uh, the but way that, that the seems Philippines no voice. looks at Taiwan, for that matter, uh, its relations with other countries, not uh, seeing it only largely in terms of overseas Filipino workers, their welfare, no, um, and concerns about uh, uh, their conditions. Um, but having said that, it's also reflective no, of the problems. And I, I guess what, 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 what we're seeing as far as that particular issue is concerned and the extent to which um, there isn't a, 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 as much of a, a, a discussion uh, regarding conditions uh, uh, and the place of Taiwan as far as, re as regional security is concerned. It's reflective of the problems and opportunities that are lost in excluding Taiwan you know, from the regional security architecture. Now, in fact, arguably speaking, this is one of the biggest anomalies in the conduct of regional security diplomacy in the East Asian region. You know? um, and that is to say the exclusion of Taiwan and issues relating to Taiwan from active participation in the region. And when we talk about the regional security architecture here, I'm actually defining it in terms of how Ron Hughes can actually talks about it. That is to say that this is a structure of relations you know, that are geared towards facilitating cooperation, um, defining expectations, uh, and uh, appropriate and, and uh, 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 of appro uh, appropriateness you know, and engagement of all states uh, uh, in the region. So in, in other words, um, when we talk about the idea of a security, of a regional security architecture, there's a tendency to actually look at it in the context of, or at least to, um, uh, uh, to emphasize you know, the role played in that security architecture by ASEAN-led multilateral ar arrangements, for instance. Now, although, of course, there's also uh, the uh, bilateral system of alliances that's actually part of that particular system. Nonetheless, the important thing that has to be taken into consideration here, and, and, and this goes back to some of the questions that were being asked, you know, uh, or asked of us, you know, um, has to do what what are the costs you know, of excluding uh, Taiwan from these uh, formal uh, arrangements? You know, uh, uh, is there is there is there something that can actually be done about it? And actually, 
um, one of the things that can 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 be said here, and, and and this goes back to what I was pointing out regarding Taiwan's uh, um, uh, response now to the pandemic and the success that it actually uh, uh, experienced as far as that's concerned, you know, um, illustrates just how potentially important Taiwan is you now as far as questions of regional security, especially on items that have to do or on issues that have to do with um, uh, non-traditional security. Um, in particular, Taiwan, Taiwan's um, uh, uh, role you know, as far as um, the environment you know, uh, and um, in, in this context, you know, fishery resources you know, is actually quite important. Taiwan has the second largest distant water fishing fleet you know, um, in, in the world. And in, in, in this context, you know, um, things that have to do with fishery resources, you know, um, help, helping to actually preserve uh, these resources, and in fact, the overfishing that takes place, you know, um, uh, uh, involves Taiwan to a very great extent, and not having them participate you know, in the kinds of discussions that take place you know, in formal multilateral arrangements. You know, um, actually lose the opportunity of engaging uh, Taiwan on those. No? Um, and yet, having said that, or, or at least implied that Taiwan might be on, on these kinds of issues, for instance, no, Taiwan might actually be part of the problem. It's also part of the solution, right? In fact, when we talk about the idea of uh, deterring illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing activities, for instance, no, um, Taiwan is actually at the forefront you know, in terms of being able to address these kinds of issues. You now, in October 2015, the European Commission actually issued a formal warning to the fishing entity of Taiwan you know, for inadequate measures, right? So, which since then, Taiwan has actually responded to you know, um, with uh, the use of uh, uh, machine learning technology, investigating certain detection techniques, you know, um, and of course, the research that's actually going uh, uh, that's that's been uh, placed into this kind of uh, um, uh, conditions. No, um, the role of the National Taiwan Ocean Ocean uh, University, for instance, no, as far as these issues are concerned, is quite important, right? And 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 this goes on to questions that have to do with um, with with. Uh, um, uh, with trafficking issues no, uh, across uh, marine territories, no, um, as well as questions that have to do with human rights at sea, for instance, no, where Taiwanese vessels were, um, were, were identified as high risk for human rights violations, no, uh, especially in questions of forced labor. And yet the thing here is that Taiwan has actually sought to actually address these kinds of issues okay, um, using the kinds of technologies that they actually uh, have been able to produce. Okay? Cybersecurity is another area where I think um, uh, we can uh, learn from the experience uh, of, 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 of Taiwan. Now, the, the point that, that's being made here is that Taiwan has much to contribute as far as the question of non-traditional security is concerned. And yet, I think the main problem as far as uh, uh, the non-participation of Taiwan and its issues uh, are concerned as far as regional security um, matters uh, uh, as, as an issue no, has to do with traditional geopolitical issues. No? Um, in, in other words, we're still talking about the idea of how um, increasingly China has violated or at least um, uh, 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 tried to actually push no? uh, the, the ADIZ of, uh, of Taiwan. No? Um, this does not create an environment of confidence you know, within the region. In, in other words, you're really talking about a situation where as China continues to actually uh, seek to change the nature of the relationship uh, between China and Taiwan, um, then I think you're really uh, uh, creating a condition where um, the geopolitical uh, conditions no, um, are becoming more and more fraught with uh, dangers as far as the region is concerned. So, in other words, no, um, if you look at regional security, I think the fact that Taiwan has been largely excluded from the formal arrangements that try to talk about no, and, and address uh, 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 these issues are concerned no, um, is something that's more of a loss no, as far as the region is concerned. There's, lot, there's a lot that Taiwan can contribute, especially when it comes to non-traditional security. And the more important thing here is that increasingly, um, 
that relationship between uh, uh, China and, and Taiwan is was identified a few years back by Brendan Taylor, for instance, one of the major flashpoints not in the region, if not the uh, uh, the flashpoint that could actually that has a realistic uh, uh, possibility of sliding into uh, uh, into actual conflict. So it is necessary for Taiwan and Taiwan uh, uh, and, and issues that concern Taiwan to be included to be part of the um, the discussions on regional security. Now the question, of course, is how you know how do we actually incorporate Taiwan and Taiwan's uh, uh, con and, and and issues that relate to Taiwan you know, within the regional security architecture within the formal uh, uh, dialogue uh, uh, arrangements you know, uh, within the region. And I think this is where the problem actually lies. What China has been able to do in the last few years you now is to really constrain the space within which Taiwan can act autonomously or to act as, 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 as a member of the international community. You know, um, what China has actually forced you know, um, is that most uh, engagements with Taiwan should actually be coursed through China. And, and I think that's part of the problem that we're actually uh, uh, facing right now. No, um, so the question, of course, is um, what can be done about these things? No, um, um, definitely, Taiwan has to be included within the uh, regional security architecture. It has to be part of the uh, arrangements that uh, uh, that that uh, that have to do with dialogue arrangements. No, um, but at the same time, this must be balanced with the question of. Doing so should not lead to, of course, a condition where China might might actually feel you know, that it is being forced into a situation where it has to assert you know, its its sovereignty over uh, uh, over China uh, over Taiwan. So, which basically means that to me, my argument has always been that um, there has to be well, it's 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 a baseball uh, uh, analogy, but 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 um, I think the way to approach this is to play small ball, so, so to speak, right? In, in, in other words, um, uh, the way to actually engage or to involve, incorporate Taiwan into the, in, into the uh, uh, regional uh, architecture um, uh, uh, should be seen in terms of uh, arrangements where Taiwan can actually be part a participant in activities, in discussions, without having to actually challenge the one China policy. Right, so which basically means that you're talking about engaging Taiwan in those kinds of activities where China doesn't feel that it, it's it's or um, uh, it could be challenged. No, it, uh, the 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 sense of China's um, uh, relationship with with Taiwan could actually be challenged. So in this case, I, I'm talking about the idea of involving Taiwanese entities, right? Universities in particular. No, and you might say that this is just bringing in track two. No, but the idea is to bring bring them into um, policy research discussions or policy discussions or policy research discussions. Track two mechanism should actually be emphasized, right? Um, and at the same time, um, I think uh, the other thing that has to be taken into consideration is to involve Taiwan in those multilateral arrangements where I think China doesn't have much of a say as far as vetoing uh, Taiwan's participation. And in this case, actually, I think the Quad might play an important role. I'm not saying that Taiwan should be part of the Quad, but many of the kinds of issues that, um, that, that have to do with Taiwan um, could actually be discussed by the Quad, right? So which means participation by Taiwan doesn't have to mean involvement of its officials or whatever, but then... Um, those issues can be discussed by the Quad as a matter of the interest of those who are actually participating in in uh, in that arrangement. The point that I have to, that I have to emphasize here is 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 that um, it is an egregious uh, uh, situation that Taiwan is not part of the dialogue process in uh, on the regional uh, security uh, uh, dialogue process in in East Asia. Um, but at the same time, it has to be recognized that China is not going to be uh, easily forced into a situation where it will accept you know, uh, that, 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 that Taiwan will be uh, participating in these kinds of processes as if it were a normal country, so to speak. Um, but so a balance must be found. And I think the balance can be found in terms of finding those spaces where um, 
there is still space for Taiwan to participate. Who is going to participate from Taiwan? And in, in this case, I'd, I'd actually say that you're talking about private entities you know, or academic entities much more than formal uh, formal government ent entities. So um, it's, it's, it's a strategy that has to actually um, be emphasized, you know, uh, the concerns of China, but at the same time, try to push back against China's insistence you know, on, on, uh, uh, on, on constraining that space within which Taiwan can actually act. So I'll stop here uh, and I'll welcome any of the questions that you might ask. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Herman, for your excellent uh, analysis. Uh, before I turn to our next speaker, I just want to tell our viewers that if you'd like to ask a question, uh, please post it to our CSIS events page. Uh, you just go to the event page that you use to register and click on the Ask the Question uh, button. And please include your name and affiliation and who you would like uh, to pose the question to. And we will collect those through uh, the event. We're now going to turn to uh, Dr. Win Hong Sun. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning to uh, all of you in uh, America, and good evening to my friends uh, and viewers from Asia. Um, what I'm going to speak about today is, uh, well, as a matter of disclaimer, it's all my personal opinion. So anyone's watching out there, please do not blame uh, my institutions or my government for my own view. Now, um, I will first address the questions of Taiwan's place in the regional uh, architecture, security architecture. Taiwan is obviously a security actor in the Indo-Pacific that simply cannot be ignored. Uh, Taiwan Strait has become a hotspot in the Indo-Pacific that is raising concern in the region and uh, that is being closely watched. Uh, whether we like it or not, Taiwan is a factor that matters to the security environment of the Indo-Pacific. In the South China Sea, Taiwan is a claimant. Taiwan is occupying Vietnam's um, well, Taiping Island, which is one of the largest islands in the Spratly areas. So Taiwan is obviously an actor that Vietnam needs to take into consideration into addressing the South China Sea issue. And therefore, um, well, Taiwan is already there in the uh, regional um, security architecture of the Indo-Pacific, whether we like it or not. Now, the fact that the Taiwan Strait has become increasingly a hotspot and become hotter in the year 2020 has actually, uh, well, while obviously is a challenge to Taiwan, is also creating more bandwidth uh, to Taiwan to air its view to for the international community to pay more attention to Taiwan's views and interests. And therefore, Taiwan will can use this increased bandwidth that it has in uh, the busy Indo-Pacific security architecture to air its narrative and to draw attention from the international community to its views and therefore to will enhance its role as an actor in the Indo-Pacific, if you like it. So while on the one hand, it is a challenge to Taiwan, but also on the other hand, it's also an opportunity for Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific security architecture. However, any attempt to formalize Taiwan's role in the uh, security architecture of the region is not going to be met with enthusiasm in uh, well, um, regional countries, especially I would say in ASEAN countries. Why? Because um, to most of the ASEAN countries, the regional security architecture is complex enough, uh, is um, uh, troublesome enough to many of them. Uh, many of them uh, sees no reason to further irritate China or to provoke China oh. on the issue of Taiwan. And, uh, well, um, you know, ASEAN recently became the number one trading partner of ASEAN, of China, and uh, amid the disruption the pandemic caused uh, to regional countries, especially to ASEAN, most of the economies in ASEAN has gone to negative territories. Many of them prioritize 
uh, stabilization and maintaining uh, well, and lessen the uncertainties in the regional environment. Therefore, um, at this stage, at this moment, I would say that the move to formalize Taiwan's uh, role in the regional architecture is not going to uh, well, uh, receive uh, support uh, from the region. Having said that, um, well, there are many other areas where uh, Taiwan can explore um, to uh, well, contribute to the regional order and to enhance its role, albeit in a less formal way. Uh, one of the way um, I think to, for Taiwan to enhance its role is to act as a contributor to the rules-based regional order. Uh, how so? Uh, first of all, uh, by being transparent and open. Uh, that the, for a rules-based order to work, they not only need to be rule maker, but they also need to be rule taker. And Taiwan can be a positive rule taker. Uh, in the regional rules-based order by uh, contributing to an open and transparent and inclusive uh, regional order. It can do so by airing its views on how the rules should be interpreted and should be made in the region. For example, um, on the law of the sea, for example, it can um, well, have a views that is distinguished from mainland China's on how it interprets the various aspects of the law of the sea. Uh, in that way, China can, um, Taiwan can create its own uh, strategic space and uh, give its voice uh, some importance that needs to be listened to. Uh, Taiwan can uh, address the question of the interpretation of the nine dash line because it originates from Taiwan at least and uh, will make the claim of the nine dash line more in line with the law of the sea. Um, Taiwan can also, as an, uh, an, a de facto player in uh, both the South China Sea and East China Sea, Taiwan can uh, help narrow the gray zones that is prevalent in both of the seas by, for example, um, well, airing its views on how uh, well provisions of the UNCLOS uh, that is uh, well not unanimously interpreted by players in the region uh, on how uh, Taiwan understand and interpret those uh, and more in line with the common understanding of the international community. Uh, I also share many of many of the views um, that. Uh, laid out by Dr. Hammond Kraft, the previous speaker, that uh, non-traditional security is also an area where Taiwan has plenty of room to play up its role. Uh, Taiwan, during the course of the pandemic, has um, excellently played up its health diplomacy. Mm -hmm. uh, the many international conferences that it conducted, sharing its expertise, um, um, have obviously uh, provided significance and prominence to Taiwan's role in an increasingly uh, well, uh, pivotal security issue uh, of our era. And Taiwan certainly uh, from that pandemic is uh, widely recognized as some uh, one an actor that can uh, positively contribute uh, to elevate non-traditional security uh, issue on Environment protection, fishery management, like what Dr. Hammond Kraft pointed out, Taiwan is a big player. Uh, the uh, ecological preservation approach that it has taken to disputed area of the Spratlys uh, can continue to be played up uh, and uh, not without uh, well, support uh, from uh, countries in the region. Uh, fishery management, which is a obviously uh, an issue uh, with regard to the South China Sea, Taiwan is a big player. Vietnam itself has well thousands of uh, uh, workers joining Taiwan's labor force working as fishermen on Taiwanese vessels in the South China Sea and into the open ocean. Uh, Taiwan obviously can play a role in, pre in protecting the uh, welfare of uh, oh. fishermen and uh, in promoting the humane treatment of fishermen caught in distress uh, at seas. 
Uh, this is an issue that is increasingly becoming a hot issue of the South China Sea, where Taiwan can certainly uh, play a leading role or at least a contributing role. Now, there are various other aspects of the uh, new uh, security issues coming up in the region where Taiwan certainly can play a role. Uh, issues like uh, submarine, submarine cables, digital connectivity, uh, the uh, well, uh, rules and uh, norms established on uh, new found technologies such as unmanned vehicles. Uh, these are areas where Taiwan has uh, certain grounds to contribute. Now, uh, with regard to the code of conduct that is being negotiated in the South China Sea, I think there is some room there uh, for Taiwan to uh, uh, also to act as a, a contributing player as well, not in the formal negotiation of the code of conduct, but there are many elements of the code of conduct that simply uh, Taiwan can uh, well air its views on, and through that um, indirect. Uh, mechanic uh, mechanisms can, can contribute uh, to um, the discussion of the mainstream uh, platform on the code of conduct. Things like incidents prevention, how to deal uh, the interactions between um, well government vessels and non-government vessel, commercial vessels, uh, how to uh, well um, uh, pro uh, confidence conduct confidence building. Uh, in the South China Sea. These are areas that is very relevant uh, to Taiwan as well. Now, the uh, problem is what mechanisms can we use uh, to draw Taiwan uh, in the cooperation? Now, uh, we, um, I think obviously we can uh, make use of the existing uh, mechan uh, mechanisms that Taiwan is already in. For example, the track two, um, well, a conference series on management of uh, potential conflict in the South China Sea um, um, that Indonesia is currently hosting uh, every year is an area, is a mechan mechanism that Taiwan needs to be more active in. CSCAP, the Council for Cooperation of the Asia Pacific is another um, world forum where Taiwan has membership. And through those um, track two channel, Taiwan can, can be more active in contributing, but Taiwan and uh, can work with uh, other track two institutions in the region to create new one or to uh, initiate new processes, uh, informal ad hoc processes that is becoming a trend these days in international relations because formal, uh, traditional and formal institutions are not playing up to their role. And therefore, there's a lot of faith put on, uh, well, informal, ad hoc, and uh, new uh, track two institutions uh, and mechaniz mechanisms. And that's where uh, Taiwan uh, needs to play up its role. So uh, let me stop there, and uh, I welcome any uh, questions or comments to my presentation. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much, Hong Sun. Uh, many real practical uh, suggestions, and I think also, like, uh, like Herman, uh, a very pragmatic uh, analysis of what is possible while recognizing that uh, there are many areas that Taiwan should be integrated uh, into the region. We're now going to turn to uh, Dr. Tanvi uh, Madan. Um, please, if you can, limit your remarks to 12 minutes or so, so we can have time for discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bonnie, and uh, good morning to those of you uh, in the U.S. and good evening to those of you in Asia. Um, to consider how India might see Taiwan's role in the Indo-Pacific, you really have to kind of step back and think about how uh, India views Taiwan itself um, and also think about the possibilities in the India-Taiwan dynamic. Um, that doesn't just provide context, but India itself is a key part of the Indo-Pacific, and so that dynamic could play a crucial role uh, even beyond anything on the regional side. So on the India-Taiwan dynamic, uh, there's three things to keep in mind. Uh, one, that India has a one-China policy, uh, though since 2010 it has declined to reaffir uh, reaffirm that policy explicitly. Uh, second, India is unlikely to jettison that one-China policy, and this is a particularly sensitive time in Delhi's interactions uh, with Beijing, given the boundary dispute uh, that's flared up. 
Uh, and third, um, despite that, there is much that India and Taiwan can do to broaden and deepen engagement below that threshold. Um, it's, it is an underdeveloped relationship and there's a lot of potential. Um, now I'm going to highlight four recent developments that can facilitate this engagement between India and Taiwan uh, from uh, India's perspective. I think one, uh, COVID-19, it has increased uh, Taiwan's profile in India and brought it positive attention and additional public platforms. Um, for instance, over the last year, you've seen both because of, especially because of Taiwan's health diplomacy, uh, but also because uh, of the forward leading position it's taken on this, uh, op-eds by a number of uh, Taiwanese officials in Indian newspapers, uh, including uh, Foreign Minister Joseph Wu, uh, also primetime interviews on TV with uh, Taiwanese officials, including Digital Minister Audrey Tang. Uh, now, this is quite unusual, and it's we haven't seen this kind of thing before in terms of uh, the public profile for Taiwanese officials in India. I think the second development uh, that will facilitate India-Taiwan engagement uh, is the China-India boundary crisis. Uh, it has hardened views about China, uh, in India. Uh, there's a reassessment of China policy to some extent, um, and it strengthened the hands of those in the Indian government calling uh, for a tougher stance uh, on uh, a, a variety of issues to do with uh, China. I think the third kind of factor uh, that could facilitate engagement uh, is the impact of both COVID-19 and the China-India boundary and, and, and China's behavior vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19 uh, and the boundary crisis is that you've seen uh, that this has already had and will continue to have an impact on India's economic, education, and technology uh, policies. Uh, the pandemic and the boundary crisis have led to a slew of measures that will restrict uh, or scrutinize Chinese activities in the economic, technology, telecom, public diplomacy, uh, and education sectors. And I think this in turn will likely lead to Indian, an Indian search for alternative sources of capital, of know-how, uh, and technology that could benefit um, uh, Taiwan. Uh, I think fourth and finally, I think developments in Taiwan itself. I think the re-election of uh, President Tsai Ing-wen, as well as the cha change in the KMT's uh, per perception of an approach towards China will reduce the concern in Delhi that there will be a, China, a, a change in Taiwan's willingness to engage uh, with India. So I think all these kind of four uh, developments will facilitate uh, could facilitate uh, Taiwan-India engagement. Um, so what can Taipei do to engage uh, India more? I think one thing to think about as an inspiration, though they're very different cases in some ways, uh, is how Israel interacted with India before their fully normalized relations. Uh, and I won't say more on that here, but I think it's worth kind of considering, uh, and it's something I've, I've written about, including for CSIS. Um, I think the approach that China should take, uh, that Taiwan should take, is a two-track approach. Uh, one, establish and expand ties with different constitu constituencies and in different sectors across India. And two, uh, deepen under the radar defense and intelligence ties and semi-visible uh, political ties. And I'll say a little bit about each of these, uh, each of these uh, tracks. I think on the first track, there are a number of steps that Taiwan can take to increase engagement with and its profile in India in the economic, healthcare, travel and tourism, education and exchanges sectors. Uh, I think this in turn will create uh, or expand constituencies for Taiwan among state governments, technical specialists, business, civil society, media and students. Um, and I think benefit people to people ties more broadly. Uh, moreover, in this uh, first track approach, I think uh, India, for example, needs investment and expertise, particularly in its manufacturing, infrastructure, food processing, and technology sectors, and moreover, is looking for non-China alternatives. And I think Taiwan, in turn, has been looking to diversify uh, its targets of investment and has strengthened those uh, sectors. So this is a good uh, match. And I think though people, I think there is, it would be uh, ideal to have an update of the economic cooperation agreement between India and Taiwan, what could also help uh, facilitate particularly economic ties is familiarizing uh, Taiwanese companies with the opportunities available in India and assisting them uh, as they navigate what can be a complicated country in which uh, to operate. Um, I think finally, kind of in this first track space, and I can say more on this in Q&A if people are interested, but I think Taiwan could consider giving India more access to its labor market. Uh, India and Taiwan have complementary interests here. Uh, Taiwan needs skilled workers and India uh, has them. 
Uh, let me say a few things about the second track before I will end with kind of talking about what the U.S. and other like-minded partners could do to facilitate India-Taiwan uh, engagement. I think the second track that I mentioned that what Taiwan can do with India is expanding diplomatic and security ties. Um, and I think this is could be done. Uh, it's not likely to be high visibility, but I think it should nonetheless be something uh, that should uh, kind of be approached uh, and considered. I think Taiwan and Delhi uh, could, and India could work to regularize the visits and exchanges by diplomatic and military officials, which have tended to be limited and ad hoc. Um, I think second, increasing, uh, enable increased and more regular interactions between parliamentarians and political parties and subnational officials. Uh, I think third, uh, if Taiwan's, for example, and, and this, this you know, would be a little more sensitive, but if Taiwan's, for example, new ties with Somaliland result in port calls uh, by the Taiwanese Navy, uh, this offers a potential for informal or opportunistic encounters with the Indian Navy in the Indian Ocean region. I think finally in this space, there's also potential for increased information and intelligence sharing. Uh, Taiwan has uh, certain areas of expertise that could particularly be useful for Indian officials in the present context, including its visibility uh, on, on China. So I'm gonna just say a few things uh, on what kind of other countries, uh, the US, but also other like-minded partners could do to facilitate uh, in these, or make this India-Taiwan engagement easier. At the end of the day, these are going to be decisions made in Delhi, keeping in mind their own sensitivities. But there are a few things that I would say uh, like-minded countries can do. I think one is to encourage both sides to take some of the steps that I outlined above and also creating awareness about them. Um, I think uh, the other like-minded countries, in particular the U.S., could also share its own experiences, uh, approaches, and mechanisms on dealing with Taiwan below the lef level of diplomatic uh, recognition. Um, another thing that could be done is the U.S. and other like-minded can provide platforms for greater India-Taiwan engagement, uh, for instance, via diplomatic and military programs and exercises. So to give you one example, um, the U.S. runs an uh, international visitors leadership program. It is intended to kind of focus South Asia, East Asia. Why not have a kind of an Indo-Pacific cone where you can have uh, Indians and Taiwanese engaged as part of the same uh, group, uh, giving them an opportunity to interact? Um, I think like-minded can also work with India in international institutions to try to ensure that Taiwan is not excluded or that at least its voice and interests uh, are heard and not ignored. Um, I think another thing is if possible, for example, uh, Washington, but also capital, other capitals could consider sharing their assessments on cross-strait relations and contingencies with India. I think this will also offer an opportunity to un for them to understand Delhi's view uh, on these contingencies as well. Um, I think there's is also going to be another kind of tougher point that I'll mention. Uh, but while this could be tougher for Taiwan, and given Taiwan's claims, uh, uh, own boundary claims vis-a-vis -vis India in kind of the, the, the Republic of China guys, I think Washington, for example, at least could encourage Taipei to revisit its stance on the India uh, boundary issue uh, and potentially share maps or historical documents that it might have related uh, to, to that subject. Again, sensitive subject, but it's something... Uh, to consider. I think beyond that, kind of, and I think uh, some of the speakers have mentioned this, uh, governments and think tanks of the like-minded countries could encourage the inclusion of Taiwanese participants or observers in various track two and track 1.5 dialogues. Uh, for instance, uh, there's a quad plus track 1.5 dialogue, why not include uh, Taiwanese participants in, in that? Um, I think another thing, and I'll say two more things uh, and then wrap up, is uh, given Taiwanese companies' limited experience within and with India, um, companies from kind of like-minded countries or chambers of commerce could encourage opportunities for them uh, to, for Taiwanese companies to compare notes with their American, Japanese, Singaporean, or South uh, uh, Korean counterparts who have frankly had more experience operating in the Indian market, uh, perhaps even via trilateral dialogues facilitated by their respective uh, chambers of commerce. I think that I'll say finally is the subject that has also come up, which is what we're really going to see is kind of issue based, co a lot of issue based coalitions. We've already seen uh, some of it, which is different permutations and combinations of countries working together. And the one that gets obviously the most attention is the quadrilateral, or the Australia, India, Japan, US quadrilateral. Um, and as Herman Croft said, you know, this is a slightly more set, you can't quite include Taiwan. Uh, but there are issues that uh, come up during quad discussions. 
where Taiwan can contribute. So, uh, and that could be on a bilateral basis. Uh, it could be informal discussions, including in terms of regional infrastructure, which includes uh, digital infrastructure connectivity, uh, investment screening, uh, countering disinformation, uh, building resilience uh, in the region. Um, and I will mention some of the issue-based coalitions that you could put, perhaps see at least Taiwan playing some sort of role in the future, though it will depend on the sensitivities of the member states involved, are things like the US, uh, sorry, the Japan, Australia, India Supply Chain Resiliency Initiative, uh, the E10 that uh, Boris Johnson has proposed, uh, the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence, um, as well as the International Solar Alliance, uh, and finally the Coalition of Disaster a resilient infrastructure. So I think there are various ways and a lot of potential uh, for uh, for Taiwan to be brought into to these uh, groupings. Thank you so much, uh, Tanri, for that excellent analysis and very concrete suggestions uh, of uh, steps that could be taken. Uh, we're going to turn finally to Dr. Alan uh, Hao Yang, uh, and then we'll open up the floor for questions. And please do send in your questions on the event page. Uh, to CSIS.org, uh, where you can just click on the button that says, uh, ask a question. Okay, Alan, over to you. Yes. Uh, hello, hello, friends in the States. Good morning. And also good evening, my friends in Asia. <clears throat> I think I mostly agree with our previous speaker. Um, <clears throat> the role of Taiwan and also uh, your point uh, on Taiwan should not be excluded in the process of regionalization. But I think my point is, we know that Taiwan should not be excluded as a stakeholder in the process, but how to include Taiwan's voice, not only through the track to channel, but also through a more con constructive way to influence the policy process that that can facilitate the not only bilateral uh, collaboration, but a more regional type. When it comes to the security architecture, I think um, um, the most pressing challenge into Taiwan is the security challenge imposed by Beijing and China's military threat over this island country. We have been living with it for more than seven decades. And in recent years, when it become more pressing, I think we should not ignore this. I would like to take 2020, the year of 2020, for example. According to our statistic, the PLA had sent its military aircraft, including the jet fighter, long range bumper, and also spy plane to our south, to Taiwan's southwestern ADIZ. You know how many times? For more than 380 times. And that imposed a security challenge, serious security challenge to Taiwan. And that's for the hard security dimension. And in addition to this hard security threat, China also weaponized the cross trade interdependence and enhanced the social penetration purposefully through the disinformation a mechanism to disintegrate the unity of Taiwanese society and also to shake the stability of our democracy. I will say that Taiwan's experiences in dealing with this social penetration and also this uh, influence can be a vivid example facing China's uh, engagement in different countries in Asia. Uh, my take on the Indo-Pacific security architecture. I think uh, our previous speaker are mostly, I, I, I would say are very, very correct that Taiwan is not included in a formal process or institutionalization process of the Indo-Pacific security architecture, but we still can contribute to some non-traditional security dimension. For the hard security architecture, I think the basic idea is to link up the like-minded countries and also the regional powers with common interest to address collectively the instability issue caused by, I would say, China's military expansionism. And this kind of security dialogue and collaboration is aimed at 
managing the rise of the hegemon or the rise of China and let Beijing clearly understand that not every country will tolerate the irrational military expansion listen, and also yes and bows under its threat and that will be a secure that will be a kind of endangering the, the democracy and also the stability in the region and in addition to uh, facilitate the security architecture i think our previous speaker are also mentioning that the core process process especially the core plus track two process can include taiwan's voice and also taiwan's viewpoint in order to facilitate a more uh, constructive uh, uh, framework of managing the regional powers i think that's a very good suggestion and also taiwan during the past years has been actively participated in the qua, uh, quasi qua pro, uh, uh, process and also some think tank dialogues and instead of yielding to the military threat and also to the weaponized independence caused by china i would say taiwan has been taking a more constructive and also a more responsible approach to engage the regional community especially our partner countries since 2016 the new southbound policy advocated by president Tsai Ing-wen and also implemented by our uh, enemies by our different ministry has shown that it is Taiwan's regional strategy for Asia the idea is to facilitate Taiwan's integration to regional community and also highlight our contribution to the prosperity and also stability of the region just as mentioned by professor craft that most of our project and also our initiative intends to contribute to the non-traditional security collaboration not only through the bilateral approach but also to share some kind of uh, experiences to nourish a more regional regional wide tide in this regard, I will say that our previous effort on the new Southbound policy is not only to link up with the regional counterpart in ASEAN country and also in South Asia, especially in India, but also to work with the major powers regional approach among our like-minded friends, especially the Japan and also United States and also our, our like-minded partners. As mentioned by Hong Sun, that Taiwan-Japan's collaboration, I would say, is aiming at deepening the economic tie between Taiwan and Japan, not only in the private sector, but also in uh, you know, the, the public sector, in order to foster more uh, economic collaboration in Southeast Asia. When it comes to the support of the U.S., in recent recently you can find that us has teamed up taiwan in the women's livelihood bound initiative in the indo-pacific and also in addition to this there are some more efforts to include taiwan as a reliable partner as a part of the international society and also a part of the process of establishing the uh, indo-pacific security architecture including non-security, non-traditional security architecture. I think those efforts will show that the world has a stake in Taiwan because we are in the front line fighting against the authoritarian rule that seriously eroded the very existence of our democracy and also imposed by the expansionism of some authoritarian regime. So I think apart from uh, my personal observation, I would like to thank our previous speaker uh, to it is important, I think at the present time, it is important to include Taiwan in the process. And also I think it is true to activate the dialogue and collaboration among the think tank 
and also the policy community. I would like to take my uh, foundation, Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation, for example. We are uh, very happy to work with India's National Maritime Foundation to address um, how Moody government's Indo-Pacific Ocean Initiative can work with Taiwan's new southbound policy in terms of the non-traditional security issue and also the marine uh, environment protection issue and also some related maritime issue. I think Taiwan's new southbound policy is a clear expression of our interest that can coexist with other partners and also neighboring countries' uh, national interest for the, for the issue of the common uh, prosperity and also for a better and resilient future. Especially during the past year, in 2020, we know that mm. the pandemic has already totally bring the structural change to our uh, daily economic order and also the social order. And Taiwan has been a very successful example and vivid case to show that uh, we don't rely on the lockdown uh, measure and we can uh, share more experiences in maintaining the transparency and also the digital governance on the pandemic uh, issue. And it is an important way to work with our neighboring country and also partner to restore the resilience among uh, our friends and also in the years to come. So finally, I would like to thank uh, Bonnie and also CSIS for the kind invitation and to include Taiwan in this meaningful dialogue. And I do look forward to uh, uh, to working with our friends in the forthcoming future. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Alan. I am uh, struck that in the conversation yesterday with experts from Japan, Australia, and the United States, uh, the uh, discussion was really focused uh, on hard security issues. And, and here we are today with experts that are talking about perspectives from India, Philippines, Vietnam, uh, and of course, Taiwan again, uh, and, and we are focusing, I think, much more on uh, non-traditional uh, security issues and taking a very practical uh, approach. We've gotten some very good questions. Uh, we have uh, a little bit over 15 minutes. So I will pose one question to each of you and, and, and please try to be concise in your answers. I'm going to start with, uh, with uh, Herman Kraft. We have a question from Brandon Lee, who is from the Anacostia Consulting Group. And he asks, would the Philippines support the idea of creating a regional maritime domain awareness network through the expansion and integration of its national watch center uh, with other nations' systems? And is there a role potentially for Taiwan uh, in such a maritime domain awareness network? Mm -hmm. Oh, you want me to answer now, yes, uh, Bonnie? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, no, uh, thank you for the question. And, and I think, yes, um, the Coast Watch uh, system in the Philippines or uh, center in the Philippines would be very much interested in being part of such a um, uh, regional system that uh, looks at maritime domains. Um, in fact, this is something that we're, we're, we're discussing uh, now uh, simply because um, uh, 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 awareness of the maritime domain is not uh, a, 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 uh, um, uh, a unilateral thing. So the, the idea of cooperating uh, on this is actually something that we're looking forward to. Does Taiwan, can Taiwan play a role in this one? Yes, uh, if only because to, to a large extent, um, Taiwan has technology for uh, uh, that it can contribute as far as this is actually concerned. And it has uh, uh, such a system is not going to be just um, uh, uh, limited to, 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 to looking at the, uh, the, um, uh, the maritime domains themselves, but what is actually taking place there. And, and I think, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, there's, there's a lot that Taiwan has actually become involved in as far as uh, um, uh, the maritime domains are actually concerned and activities that take place within that. Thank you. 
Great. Well, and now we'll turn to uh, Hong Sun. Uh, we have a question from Charles Kimball, who is from the Korea Center for International Finance. And, and the question that he asks is about the plans uh, that China has to revise its maritime traffic safety law. Um, and I think this pertains to uh, recent reporting about the Chinese Coast Guard, uh, its law enforcement vessels, and the uh, ability uh, potentially uh, for it to block uh, vessels under this new law um, if it deems that international uh, law is in some way being uh, violated. Uh, mm -hmm. they, uh, so um, uh, uh, others may want to comment on this as well, but the specific question from Charles Kimball is that uh, if uh, China actually began uh, using its Coast Guard vessels to block other vessels. For example, if, oh. if there are ships that are heading to Taiwan, um, how would your country react uh, to this? And, and, and maybe you can comment more generally on the new law and what you think it means for the South China Sea. Mm. Okay, I think this is a very good question. And the uh, well, draft law that China proposed uh, clearly raised alert in the region, not because it's... Uh, uh, not because it's a it's it's out of the practice uh, to carry weapons and to use weapon on certain scenarios by law enforcement agencies mm. in the region, but because of the ambiguity in China's applications of those uh, well, of of force and uh, of those weapons in territories which China doesn't have jurisdiction on the fact that China can possibly use um, the Coast Guards and use force on international water, for example, is what is raising a concern in the region. The, the fact that China might begin using force to enforce well, uh, its law on other countries' exclusive economic zones, areas where China have no jurisdiction according to the law of the sea, is what is raising concern in the region. So if uh, for one nice day China turned up to use uh, those weapons and use force by the Coast Guards to enforce laws in areas outside of its jurisdiction, that day I think uh, the, the, the international community should be really alert and should be really uh, concerned because uh, China is clearly is militarizing, expanding the militarization um, of, of its, um, and, and China's Coast Guard, everybody knows, it's not the Coast Guards. It's, uh, it's part of its Navy, now under direct control of the Central uh, Commission, uh, Military Commission. Um, so uh, what are we going to do? I think um, uh, it's uh, very important that uh, ASEAN and international community uh, be aware of the risk involved with this new move by China. It's uh, it's uh, a development uh, that could potentially uh, drive up uh, conflicts and drive up incidents in the South China Sea. It could uh, well disrupt the free flow of, of uh, uh, navigation and of uh, well regular uh, commercial trade in the region. Something that we need um, to uh, speak with one voice against uh, this new development uh, by China. Thank you so much, uh, Hong Sun. Uh, Tanvi, I'm going to uh, turn to you next. And uh, from my perspective, uh, it is interesting to watch India's developing relations with Taiwan. In many ways, it seems that uh, the improvement of that relationship is in reaction to the deterioration in India's ties uh, with China. And so it looks like India is trying to use Taiwan to get leverage over China. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, I wonder if you agree with that. And uh, if to, to extend the question, if India's relations with China further deteriorate, if there are more border uh, skirmishes, wider skirmishes, uh, or other uh, episodes that involve uh, Tibet, for example, um, do you think that that then would leave, lead India uh, to further strengthen its ties with Taiwan. And of course, the opposite side of the coin is if India's relations with China improve, then 
then does that then negatively affect India's ties with, with Taiwan? Uh, so um, I'm curious about whether my analysis is correct. Um, thanks, Bonnie. I, I think, you know, this is why I think it's important for um, uh, this, and, and this is something I think that has been discussed uh, in kind of the Indian strategic community, that it sh this shouldn't just be seen as playing a Taiwan card or a Tibet card, um, because at the end of the day, you know, that will uh, then, it, it's, it's dependent on the vagaries of the India-China relationship entirely. Uh, but I do think uh, nonetheless, it is important while this window of opportunity exists uh, to start or, or not start, to continue in some cases, to start in others, take advantage of uh, this kind of atmosphere that exists in India because it has opened a window. And so I think it the if this opportunity allows you know, the establishing of networks, of ties, where it shows to different constituencies in India that Taiwan can be a useful partner, uh, then that is something that regardless of what happens in India-China ties, then you have kind of, uh, a, a, the relationship has proved its utility. And often particularly on the security side, which it's hard to say much about publicly, but that's if utility of a relationship is proven, I think it will be sustainable. Um, I think that's also the case, for example, uh, on the economic side. And the reason I think that is important, even to the security question, is these are ways, these are stepping stones to have a very different conversation, an independent, a, a relatively, can't be entirely independent, but an India-Taiwan dynamic that's, you know, has a certain amount of independence from the India-China dynamic, is that if you look, about, uh, look at things like economics, technology, uh, but even some of the security issues, uh, these are not just about what has happened in the last year with India-China ties. Uh, these are movements, whether it is India trying to diversify its suppliers, trying to kind of uh, attract companies from uh, from different uh, countries uh, to become part of global value chains. These are things that are independent of what is happening uh, with India-China. Having said that, I think your, your concern is valid, um, that it should not just be linked to the India-China issue. I will say, I think, um, you, the, 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 it always plays differently in the sense if India-China relations deteriorate further, in some ways that sometimes makes India more sensitive about doing things that are even more provocative. For example, India will probably prioritize doing more with the US that could be seen as provocative by China rather than doing something uh, with, uh, with Taiwan. It's also sensitive about kind of it has its own kind of disputed territories that it wouldn't want China to kind of intervene or take very public stances on, uh, even though China, for example, uh, has taken some uh, kind of wishy-washy stance on Kashmir, for example. So I think it will be sensitive. The last thing I will say is um, I think on, on India-China relations, even if uh, to, to kind of talk about your final, your kind of second scenario, even if uh, this relationship gets back to the point of being stabilized. I don't think it can go back to where it was uh, prior to the boundary dispute uh, and this last year. I think there's just too many lines that have been crossed. So I think this will fundamentally change the kind of nature expectations and extent of that engagement uh, with China. So it might be stabilized, uh, but I think it will be in, uh, rather than a trust but verify situation, the India will look at China in a verify don't trust situation. So I, I don't think it's going to go. Thank you so much, uh, Tanvi. Uh, I'm now going to ask a, a question to uh, Alan, Alan Yang, Yang. And uh, my question for you, Alan, is under the Trump administration, Taiwan was included very explicitly in the Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, in fact, it was in June of 2019 that the Defense Department released a report on the Indo-Pacific strategy. Taiwan was included in a section with New Zealand uh, and Mongolia and Singapore uh, as a close partner uh, of the United States. And, and I think that was unprecedented. So this clearly led to a strengthening or was part of a strengthening of the U.S.-Taiwan relationship. But I'd like to ask you if it opened up new opportunities with other countries in the Indo-Pacific region. Did this explicit backing for Taiwan enable Taiwan to do things uh, with countries like uh, the Philippines, Vietnam, uh, or others uh, that it had previously been unable to achieve? 
thank you. Thank you, Bonnie, for your question. I think, uh, I think this is only my personal experience, personal opinion. I think we are grateful that the major power and also our partner in different corner of the world can view Taiwan as a useful partner, as mentioned by uh, Tommy, that we can be through through our practice of any kind of contribution or policy that we prove that Taiwan can contribute and also this meaningful contribute can also facilitate uh, the regional engagement or regional approach of major power in the Asia Pacific or the, in the Indo Pacific. So we are grateful that during the past four years, I will say explicitly that the new South Bank policy was seen by the major counterpart of Taiwan and also regarded as a meaningful engagement approach to the regional peace and also prosperity. And we do look forward for the next phase of the new South Bank policy. From my personal opinions, I will say it's not only to link up with the regional counterpart or the ASEAN countries, but also to work closely with the major uh, partners and like-minded countries, not only in Asia, but also in the Western countries, so that we can attract and in include more resources and also momentum to contribute to the regional resilience, especially after the pandemic in the restoration of the new normal. So I will say that with the support and recognition of, for example, Japan, uh, the European country and also the United States recognition to our contribution during the past four years will mean very, will be very meaningful to the continuity of Taiwan's responsible approach to contribute to regional community. Thank you. Well, this has been a very rich discussion and uh, I think we covered a lot of ground and had some really excellent suggestions uh, for how to work uh, more closely and integrate Taiwan uh, into the security in the region, even if not into uh, the formal architecture. So I'd like to thank uh, all of you, uh, Herman Kraft, uh, Win Hong Sun, uh, Tanvi Madden, and, uh, and Alan Hao Yang for joining us today. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's just a great opportunity uh, to hear so many voices from uh, so many different countries uh, in the world. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. We're now going to turn to the final portion uh, of this program, uh, which is a keynote speech and uh, conversation with Foreign Minister Joseph Wu. Uh, Joseph Wu has been the Foreign Minister of Taiwan since February of 2018. And prior to serving in this role, he was Secretary General uh, in the office of, uh, of the President. Uh, Minister Wu has been working tirelessly to advance Taiwan's international position and to strengthen uh, U.S.-Taiwan relations um, and Taiwan's relations with countries around the world. Uh, he's been a valued partner, working with diplomats uh, around the world as well as with think tanks. Uh, I personally admire his boundless energy and optimism, as well as his accomplishments. And most of all, I value his friendship. The speech you are about to hear, uh, as well as the conversation between me and, uh, and Minister Wu, was recorded this past Thursday evening, uh, which was Friday morning Taiwan time, uh, because it is a bit late uh, in Taipei uh, right now. So um, please uh, enjoy this segment uh, with Foreign Minister Joseph Wu. Although life in Taiwan has been largely normal amid the global pandemic, I do miss seeing many good friends and visitors like Bonnie, and I look forward to the possibility of receiving the annual CSI's dedication in Taipei, hopefully in the near future. With just a week out from the U.S. presidential inauguration, 
I want to take this opportunity to thank the Trump administration for their work in advancing our bilateral relationship to the level that is stronger than it has ever been. I also look forward to working with the incoming Biden administration on those issue areas based on our shared interests and values that are encapsulated by the Taiwan Relations Act, as well as the six assurances. One of the new administration's most urgent priorities is to ensure security and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region. In President-elect Biden's words, it is to build coalition of like-minded partners and allies to make common cause in defense of our shared interests and values. His message is particularly reassuring to the democracies in the region under siege by increasing direct, overt, and mounting pressure from the communist China's expansionism and its abuses on trade, technology, human rights, and other fronts, as President-elect pointed out. Taiwan welcomes the incoming administration's clear-eyed position of the threats, as we are no doubt at the front line of managing that threat. If Taiwan were to fall prey to China, it would greatly expand Beijing's reach into the Indo-Pacific region and significantly upend the rules-based international order. Therefore, countries that share the same vision of a secured and prosperous future have to work together to deter China's belligerent behavior. We have seen encouraging signs of how various regional security coalitions step up their multi-pronged efforts to tackle these shared challenges. And there has been growing recognition of Taiwan's strategic importance in such multilateral fora. For example, in the joint press conference of the Quad Ministerial in Tokyo last October, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo called for collaboration to protect people and partners from the CCP's exploitation, corruption, and coercion, with examples encompassing the Taiwan Strait. Earlier in last July, the joint statement of Australia, the United States Ministerial Consultation, or OSMIN, reaffirmed Taiwan's important role in the Indo-Pacific region, intent to maintain strong ties with Taiwan and to support Taiwan's participation in international organizations, among other areas of support. We also see that Tokyo shares Washington's concern over growing Chinese military and political pressure on Taiwan. An increasing coordination between the two allies on encouragements with Taiwan would be a critical step forward. Another welcome trend is a renewed congressional focus on military capabilities in the Western Pacific, as evidenced by the 2018 Asia Reassurance Initiative Act and the 2020 Indo-Pacific Deterrence Initiative. Besides paying close attention to these trends and regional security dynamics, we also seek to work with the U.S. and like-minded partners to address non-conventional security issues. One salient example is to strengthen our cooperation in infrastructure development, particularly in the Pacific. Last se September, Taiwan and the U.S. established the framework to strengthen infrastructure finance and market building cooperation, um, aiming to enhance collaboration among regional infrastructure investment and finance initiative, as well as promoting transparency and building capacity in the region. Another example of innovative platform to facilitate the optimal responses to Chinese gray zone operations is the annual Taiwan-U.S. consultations on democratic governance and in the Indo-Pacific region. This dialogue launched in September 2019 enabled my ministry and the U.S. Department of State to act in concerted efforts to promote open governments, empower civil societies, and counter disinformation. Needless to say, the Global Cooperation and Training Framework, or GCTF, has proven to be a very effective platform where Taiwan can contribute its professional expertise. To date, more than 1,500 representatives from 68 countries have taken part in GCTF workshops on issues areas, including public health, law enforcement, media literacy, cybersecurity, disaster relief, and women's empowerment. Japan has formally joined the GCTF since 2019, and many of the workshops have been co-hosted by countries such as Australia, Sweden, 
the Netherlands, and Guatemala. We are particularly encouraged by the U.S. government's financial support through allocation of U.S. $3 million in GCTF activities under the anonymous appropriation bill for fiscal year 2021. I would also add that there are many robust discussions on how to advance complementary interests with our Southeast Asian and Indian friends under the new Southbound policy. We do see conversion priorities between the new Southbound policy and the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. There will be ample room for some expansion of policy areas that would enhance the new Southbound policy's attractiveness to the region by playing to Taiwan's strength. Building on the strong pillars of these initiatives, I'm hopeful that we can continue to work with the incoming administration to incorporate discussions on how to bring Taiwan's strength to bear with regards to regional security, challenges that can benefit a secure and prosperous Indo-Pacific region. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your remarks, uh, Minister Wu. Very comprehensive. And it's quite clear that Taiwan is really stepping up in the Indo-Pacific region, I think, in very important ways. And the Trump administration, I think, has facilitated uh, some of the progress that has been achieved. I wonder if you could talk um, a bit about areas where Taiwan uh, could make more of a contribution if uh, China did not uh, put more pressure on other countries to not work with Taiwan um, and, uh, and oppose Taiwan's uh, uh, participation. So, for example, in the South China Sea, where Taiwan is, is it, an, an important player, uh, obviously uh, occupying the, the largest, <clears throat> excuse me, the largest island uh, in, uh, in the Spratlys, Taiping, uh, and also, of course, the Dongsha or Pratas Islands. So uh, could Taiwan, for example, play a role in protecting fish in the environment? Could it contribute to the peaceful management of disputes in the South China Sea? Well, thank you very much for that wonderful question. Uh, the reason why I say it's a wonderful question, because uh, as Taiwan look at the region, you know, other than the Taiwan Strait area, uh, we do see that uh, China, uh, you know, the South China Sea has become a very hot spot. Uh, China has been trying to expand its power in the South China Sea uh, through its, uh, uh, you know, military flights uh, in the region and also its vessels in the region. And the vessels will include the military vessels, the Coast Guard vessels, and also the armed. Uh, fishing militia or you know, civil militia. And all these activities has uh, intensified uh, the uh, threat in the region or the disability in the region. And of course, as you say, you know, we have uh, the largest island in uh, the South China Sea, which is uh, Taiping Island or Ituaba. Uh, and we can fully utilize uh, Ituaba for peaceful purposes. Uh, I'm sure you remember uh, after the uh, International Court of Arbitration made the announcement. Uh, the president convened, our president convened a National Security Council meeting, and uh, we have publicly issued a statement on our position in the South China Sea. And in that statement, uh, we uh, say that uh, all uh, claimants of the South China Sea uh, needs to follow the international law, particularly the uncles and we uphold the rights of freedom of navigation and freedom of overrides, of overflights. And all countries need to go through peaceful means to negotiate with each other. And hopefully Taiwan can be included in that multilateral discussion. Uh, and other than this uh, basic uh, attitude or policy, uh, we also make it public uh, that we will go through our uh, scientific cooperation with other countries uh, whether they are part of the claimants of the South China Sea. Uh, we can do joint research on uh, the ecology or landscape or, or ocean or climate. And in fact, our Ministry of Science and Technology have already started uh, to provide some uh, scholarships uh, for scholars in the region to uh, work together. And other than that, 
Uh, we have also done some joint and search rescue operations. Uh, we intend to use Ituaba as a base for uh, humanitarian need, and we have started that. It will continue to play up Taiwan's role as a peacemaker in the South China Sea. Well, if uh, the United States or Japan or other countries, including the claimants of the South China Sea, can think about how to use Ituaba as a center for humanitarian need or uh, for uh, science and uh, technology research. And I think Taiwan can make significant contributions to the peace and stability in the South China Sea. One of the focuses of the discussions that we're having in the events with uh, representatives, experts from, from uh, countries around the Indo-Pacific region it is about the regional architecture. And, and obviously the Indo-Pacific is nothing like Europe. We don't have a NATO. We have a hodgepodge of uh, structures. And some countries are members of some mechanisms and not of others. Uh, Taiwan, mm -hmm. of course, is a member of APEC. Uh, the United States is a member of some of the mechanisms like the East Asia Summit, but of course not of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Yes. Uh, and, yes. and, and China is a member probably of most of uh, the, the mechanisms that, that exist in, in the region. Um, uh, ASEAN plus three, um, and uh, of course the uh, Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Measures in, in Asia. So, you know, if we look at these, uh, this jumble of, uh, of different mechanisms, do you think that they, the structure, or, uh, informal structure that exists in, in the region, do you think that this is serving the region's interests well, or is there a better way to organize security in, in the region? Should, should we start afresh? Should we build new institutions? Should we try to be more inclusive or something else? Uh, again, this is a very good question. Uh, the reason why we think it is important to think about a more encompassing uh, regional security ar architecture is because, you know, Taiwan is uh, many people say, or Taiwan Strait has been uh, said as a flashpoint. But unfortunately, uh, Taiwan, other than being able to participate in APEC, uh, has been excluded from most of the uh, regional organizations, uh, including uh, ASEAN Plus, uh, or ASEAN Regional Forum, or even Quad. Uh, and therefore, we need to think about how uh, Taiwan's interest uh, can be taken into consideration in some of these uh, regional uh, security architecture. Uh, and among all this uh, regional security architecture, as you mentioned, or you know, what I said a little bit earlier, uh, I think uh, ASEAN Regional Forum uh, can be very important. Uh, this is the forum uh, that would discuss South China Sea. And of course, you know, we are uh, a claimant to the South China Sea. And therefore, if Taiwan can be included in the uh, ASEAN Regional Forum, and I think it can contribute to the uh, regional peace and stability by taking into account uh, the uh, you know, considerations of uh, Taiwan. Uh, another way of looking at the uh, regional security is we need to identify the source of instability and source of threat. And of course, it's China. China has been expanding rapidly in the region. You know, we talked about the uh, South China Sea. China is also expanding very rapidly in East China Sea, sending ships, uh, official vessels into the disputed water continuously. And that got our uh, friend and ally Japan uh, very nervous. And if you look, uh, the Taiwan Strait is even more alarming that the Chinese military vessels and uh, military airplanes have been cruising around the region all the time, uh, trying to intensify their threat and coercion against Taiwan. So we need to think about something more formal or something uh, more security oriented rather than just discussing some of the uh, regional uh, issues. And in that sense, I would say that the uh, Quad is something uh, that is very important for us to think about. Uh, Quad is uh, composed of India, Japan, the United States, and Australia, and they all have a stake in the peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, even though this primarily uh, is uh, uh, being convened for the foreign ministers or secretary of state uh, to meet with each other and to discuss the uh, security uh, issues in the region. 
Uh, but I think we need to go deeper to discuss the security challenges in the region so that uh, the Quad countries or other like-minded countries can, can join in uh, to discuss more on the security challenges in the region. I, I know it's going to be very hard for Taiwan to play a, a formal role in the Quad, uh, but we can do bilaterally. Uh, for example, if the United States and uh, Japan or uh, Taiwan can think about how to identify the issue areas in the Taiwan Strait area and for Taiwan to play its role uh, so that uh, uh, the region, the Indo-Pacific region, can benefit from Taiwan's strength. And that is something that we can consider. Uh, and there's also one thing we might also uh, be able to consider. You know, after the Quad meetings, ministerial meeting, there might be some working level officials meeting and Taiwan can participate in some of the side tracks of those discussions. And of course, we can benefit from those formal discussions. We can have uh, more knowledge about those uh, formal discussions. And at the same time, Taiwan can raise also some uh, of our concerns or our hope uh, for Taiwan to be able to make contributions. So this is uh, what we are considering. And I would like to stre stress again, uh, we need to identify uh, the source of the instability in this region. And I think it's more than obvious uh, if you look at Hong Kong. It's clearly expansion of authoritarianism, and that is something that the uh, federal democracies should not tolerate. So if we take Hong Kong situation as an example, I'm sure many countries in the region uh, can think about some joint efforts. And if you look at the East China Sea, Taiwan Strait, and South China Sea, I'm sure uh, the Quad countries can also think about how Taiwan can make contributions. And I would like to assure you and the audiences that Taiwan is able and willing to participate in any of those uh, discussions so that Taiwan can make contributions to regional prosperity and security. In the past year, Taiwan has outperformed virtually every other country in the world in controlling the spread of uh, COVID-19. And you know, many people around the world who may not have known very much about Taiwan previously, I think now have a lot of interest in Taiwan and positive feelings for Taiwan. So I think this creates opportunities for Taiwan going forward. And, and I'm guessing that you share that view. So how can Taiwan capitalize on this very precious opportunity? Uh, yes, indeed, we are, we are discussing about this, how Taiwan can be more helpful to the uh, international community. Uh, I do agree with you that Taiwan is being noticed by the international community uh, after the pandemic hit the world very hard. Uh, we did a little calculation. Uh, it's about 3,500 uh, news reports on Taiwan's ability to deal with the COVID situation. And I think the government and the people here uh, feel very proud about that. And also because Taiwan's ability to deal with the COVID situation, uh, we have praises from international leaders uh, and they also supported Taiwan's international participation, particularly in the WHO from uh, Secretary Pompeo, from Canada's Prime Minister, Australian Prime Minister, New Zealand Prime Minister, and also from uh, Japan's top leaders. So this is a new situation for us. And if Taiwan is able to deal with COVID-19 situation, and I'm sure the international community can understand that if Taiwan can be part of the WHO, we can make contributions uh, through these international organizations, and Taiwan is ready to do that. And we also have uh, plenty of productions uh, on some of the PPEs that can provide uh, the protection of the frontline personnel. And we have been doing that, you know, free donation rather than, you know, charge in a very expensive way. Uh, and the products coming from Taiwan are first rated. There's no doubt about that. So we are also ready to uh, make available to the international community through our ability to gear up uh, the production of the PPEs. Uh, but I think the most important uh, of all is that those countries uh, that who want to uh, be able to deal with the situation can uh, utilize Taiwan's experience uh, in uh, doing that. Uh, and we are uh, very generous in trying to share our experiences. Uh, in the past half a year or so, uh, we did have around 80 video conferences 
uh, to various countries, to some countries that do not even have a formal relations with Taiwan or very light relations with Taiwan. They want to learn from Taiwan, and our experts over here uh, try to provide these kinds of experience uh, through video conferences. Uh, and, you know, for India alone, there are more than 1,000 medical doctors. Uh, they shared our experience through video conference. So this is very important. Uh, our former, former Vice President, CJ Chen, he himself is an expert uh, in public health. And he was very generous in providing his uh, expert views uh, to whoever wants to learn from him. And of course, uh, Tang Feng, Audrey Tang, our uh, Minister Without Portfolio is also an expert in IT uh, elements of how to fight COVID-19. And he's also, she is also very generous in the going on the video conferences to provide our experiences. So this is what we can do, and we will continue to do that. And I think one thing is uh, very clear, uh, excluding Taiwan from the international organization. Uh, like WHO, is not right, It's not fair to the Taiwanese people, and it's not fair to the international community. So we certainly hope that uh, with the more understanding of Taiwan's ability and more understanding of uh, Taiwan's situation, uh, we hope that the international community can provide more support uh, to Taiwan's participation in the international organizations such as WHO. It's not just you know, a, a political motivation, and I think this is a motivation for Taiwan to benefit the international society. You know, I mentioned about New Zealand, Australian, and Canadian, Canadian uh, prime ministers and other uh, senior officials. Uh, we do see more and more countries, more and more parliaments throughout the world are supporting Taiwan's participation in the World Health Organization. Uh, in November's resume session, we have more than 1,700 parliamentarians from Europe to Latin America to Africa came out to support Taiwan's participation in the international organizations. Going forward, we will see more support, uh, which is going to benefit uh, the international community. Can you comment at all? I know you're not in charge of relations with Beijing, but obviously they affect Taiwan, so you're aware of everything going on. Do you see China being um, more or less flexible uh, in this whole COVID-19 pandemic period? I, I know that, for example, Taiwan has participated in, in COVAX, uh, and uh, that perhaps is, is a result of greater pressure from the international community. So do you see the potential maybe for China to be more flexible or is the trend in the opposite direction? Uh, what we see is that uh, Beijing is less flexible uh, in dealing with Taiwan. Uh, whenever we have some uh, interactions, even through video, uh, with the international community, China would always come in and try to suppress uh, our relations. Uh, just give you one example, which is India. Uh, there were some reports in India about Taiwan's National Day. And then the Chinese diplomats in uh, India uh, was coming up with a very strong statement telling the Indian government and even the India uh, media uh, to follow the one China principle, that Taiwan is only one part, and Taiwan cannot have a National Day, and they cannot call Taiwan president as president. So this is the kinds of situation we see. Uh, and we have seen it virtually everywhere the Chinese diplomats are coming up with a stronger lines uh, against Taiwan. Uh, you probably noticed very well that beginning from January the 2nd uh, in uh, 2019, uh, Xi Jinping came up with a very strong statement concerning Taiwan. Uh, in, in that statement, he tried to equate uh, the 1992 consensus to one China principle, to unification, to one country, to system model. And that provoked a, a very strong reaction uh, from Taiwan's side. Uh, but I think the Chinese government basically has been following that. And if that is the top order or document guiding Beijing's policy toward Taiwan, you know, the way we see it is that uh, there's going to be very little flexible, very little room for flexibility uh, for Beijing to deal with Taiwan. But fortunately, uh, we see more and more members of the international community. They think that uh, Taiwan deserves a place. Taiwan deserves a voice, or Taiwan deserves to play 
uh, a role in the international community. So you mentioned about COVAX, uh, and you also see that uh, uh, the uh, Czech Senate president was willing to lead a large delegation to Taiwan uh, to learn from our experience and also to engage uh, the business communities in between the two countries. And we also see the United States uh, willing to send high-level officials to Taiwan uh, to discuss with us on various uh, issue areas. So this is a positive trend. And as long as the international community, especially the like-minded countries, can think that uh, Taiwan can play a positive role uh, in the international community, uh, I think China's uh, heavy-handed way in dealing with Taiwan uh, is not going to work. And I do see hope in this. I'd like to ask you, Minister Wu, about your perspective on the U.S. policy of strategic ambiguity, which, as you know, refers to the fact that the United States doesn't take a clear position on whether or not it would come to Taiwan's defense uh, if it were attacked. Um, since we no longer have mutual defense treaty between uh, our two countries, we don't have an Article 5 uh, commitment. And so this policy has been in place for some time, and some people are now arguing that strategic ambiguity is outdated and the U.S. should uh, instead adopt a position of strategic clarity, basically stating that regardless of the circumstances, that the United States would come to Taiwan's defense. So proponents of changing the policy, people like uh, Council on Foreign Relations President Richard Haas, who wrote about this in Foreign Affairs, um, believe that a position of strategic clarity would strengthen deterrence, make it less likely that China would launch an attack uh, on Taiwan. Opponents uh, believe that it, in fact, might be harmful to deterrence um, for at least three reasons. Uh, I, I think a pledge to defend Taiwan uh, could provoke a PRC attack rather than deterring it. Uh, it could embolden, some people say, future Taiwan administrations to push for independence, uh, even though the current uh, administration under Tsai Ing-wen has made it clear that that is not the policy. And, and the third, I think, concern is that a pledge uh, to defend Taiwan, regardless of the circumstances, could disincentivize Taiwan from doing more to actually bolster, bolster its capabilities to defend itself. Um, so I think those are sort of the three baskets of concerns that people have. So I wonder if you could comment on your thoughts about U.S. policy and whether you think that the position of strategic ambiguity is outdated. Well, it might not be good for Taiwan's foreign minister to comment on those uh, policy discussions, but I do uh, read those discussions uh, with high interest. Uh, those discussions, whether it's coming from the ambiguity side or clarity side, you know, they are discussing uh, the U.S. interests uh, in seeing Taiwan as a, a democracy and also seeing Taiwan as a peaceful uh, and uh, prosperous country. So those discussions, whether they are coming from uh, either side, uh, is very encouraging to Taiwan. Uh, we, we will continue to engage in discussions uh, with uh, scholars, experts, in the, even officials uh, from either camp. Uh, but I think the real world is not a dichotomy. Uh, I think we need to uh, look at the situation from Taiwan's front, from uh, the Chinese front, or from the regional reactions. Uh, for Taiwan's side, uh, you know, we have seen more than four years of the Thai administration, and I think we are all more than clear uh, President Tsai has maintained a very responsible and very moderate uh, policy, either dealing with the international community or dealing with China. And that has been recognized. And that's President Tsai's leadership style in dealing with the international community. And there are more than three years left in President Tsai's administration. And that will continue to be our policy. And if there's going to be another administration uh, after uh, President Tsai's administration, of course, you know, Taiwan is a democracy, of course, we will have a succeeding uh, administration. Uh, our advice to the succeeding uh, administration, uh, and we will tell them that the reason why Taiwan is having better relations than ever with Japan, with the United States and other like-minded countries, is because we are a responsible and very moderate player in this region, and we should continue that policy. 
So this is uh, what we will do. And uh, second aspect of that is uh, the security uh, element of Taiwan. In the last few years, uh, I think uh, American friends have uh, noticed that uh, we have been making more investment in our own security. And we understand that defending Taiwan is primarily our own responsibility. And we are absolutely determined to defend ourselves. We not only make investment, increase our own budget, but try to discuss with other like-minded countries, especially the United States, concerning the areas that are most critical for Taiwan to be able to defend itself. So this is on Taiwan's side. And for Taiwan to be uh, a country that China thinks that uh, Taiwan is not just Taiwan. Taiwan is part of the international community. Uh, the foreign ministry here will continue to engage with like-minded countries. You know, our relations with the United States has been very well, uh, and we will continue to engage with other like-minded countries, you know, India, Europe, Canada, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and et cetera, so that uh, other like-minded countries will consider uh, peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait is very important and to their interests. And by that time, I think they will pay more attention to the Taiwan Strait. Uh, and another element that we need to take into consideration is uh, uh, the international reactions to China's expansionism. Uh, the United States has certainly geared up its uh, freedom of navigation operations, not just in uh, the South China Sea, but also through the Taiwan Strait. Uh, for last year alone, we saw uh, 13 transits of American military ships to the Taiwan Strait. And even though this is a freedom of navigation operations, but we all know that when the American ships are transiting through Taiwan Strait or anywhere near Taiwan, it's a show of American determination to make a presence in this region. And that kind of presence is being noticed not just by Taiwan, but also by other countries. And we appreciate that very much. And we also noticed that uh, there are other countries that are coming into play as well. Uh, we saw Canadian ships. Uh, we saw that uh, the UK is about to send uh, aircraft carriers into the region. Uh, we saw French ships, uh, Japanese ships, and also Australian ships uh, coming into this region, particularly going to the South China Sea. And I think this is an international effort that we really appreciate, that there are more and more like-minded countries who are willing to work together to deter aggression. So this is uh, what is the most important. And I would like to uh, stress the last uh, element in Taiwan-US relations. Uh, we do have a stake in our relations with the United States, which is the most important friend and ally of Taiwan. And we will engage with the United States, not just in the security area, but also in any other area that will benefit uh, the two sides. One of the things that we have been engaging with the United States, and gradually there are more countries are coming into play, is GCTF, as I said in uh, the statement a little bit earlier. Uh, the GCTF now is a, uh, I would say, an international operation. Uh, there are more and more countries who are willing to come into play. And uh, uh, I'm also anticipating more countries. Uh, you know, it would be surprisingly wonderful for you to know uh, when they come into uh, the GCTF. Uh, they are willing to work together with Taiwan, the United States, and Japan to co-host some of the uh, workshops. And, you know, the GCTF has uh, uh, encompassing on non-traditional security areas, uh, which uh, are very important to uh, all the countries in this, this region. Uh, let me mention specifically cybersecurity uh, or law enforcement or HADR, media literacy, which is very important. You know, it deals with uh, uh, disinformation campaign, maritime security, and energy security. All these are the non-traditional security challenges that we face in the region. And if we can continue to uh, work together with the United States and Japan uh, so that Taiwan can make substantive contributions through GCTF, and I think it's going to work in the benefit of the region. And this is the most important regional architecture, the way I see it, that Taiwan can play a significant role. And the United States is already the co-host of uh, this GCTF, and we'll continue to work together with the United States. And you probably noticed that uh, Taiwan-U.S. security discussions have been uh, elevating its uh, level 
uh, and also expansion of the scope, which is very good. Uh, that means that the United States will understand more about Taiwan's ability to be able to defend itself. Uh, and the United States will also use those kinds of dialogues or discussions to provide their expertise for Taiwan to gain knowledge so that Taiwan can be better prepared in the event of an attack from China. And these will also benefit uh, Taiwan and U.S. Uh, together. So uh, I would say that uh, Taiwan-U.S. Uh, relations is so important, uh, no matter how uh, friends in the uh, the United States saying that uh, it should be more strategic clarity or ambiguity. They will all work in Taiwan's benefit, and we appreciate that very much. Thank you so much. It's really been a privilege uh, having you today and having this conversation with you. Uh, and 2021 is a new year, and I think uh, there will be more opportunities for uh, U.S.-Taiwan relations, as well as for Taiwan's continuing contributions to peace and security in the Indo-Pacific region. So there's uh, much to look forward to once we get control of the spread of COVID-19. And I look forward, hopefully, to seeing you in person sometime later in the year. So thank you again. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I know uh, vaccines uh, have started to be applied. And after vaccines are you know, applied in a more popular way, uh, maybe I can travel again, and uh, that will be the time we're ready to welcome you in Taipei. And thank you very much for this opportunity for me to speak with you. I want to thank all of our viewers for joining us uh, today. Both uh, the session today and part one uh, will be online at CSIS.org and YouTube uh, so that you can go back and review or listen to uh, if you have missed them. Uh, our discussions of the Indo-Pacific regional security architecture and uh, Taiwan. Again, I'm Bonnie Glazer. I'm director of the China Power Project. Uh, thank you again. Thank you.